Before we start today's video, I'd like to take this opportunity to give a mention to Corey Mitchell. I'm sure that many of you watching this video are familiar with who he is, but in case you're not, he was the one that wrote the book Pure Murder, a book which documents this awful tragedy and provides us with many answers as well. Without the work that Corey Mitchell had put in, we really wouldn't know what we now know today about this case. My goal with this video series is to address some of the questions that I've had ever since I first learned about the murders. Although the criminals were brought to justice many years ago, there are still some unanswered questions about why this crime came to be. I won't be going into the details of what happened to the girls during the assault, nor the trial of the criminals. That information has already been covered before. However, I would like to share with you what I have learned about this case. I know that many of us still have questions about it. So without further ado, welcome to part two of three. The time is now 11.15 on the evening of June 24th, 1993, and the girls have reached the Clearbrook apartment complex on West 34th Street. They have about a mile to go to reach Elizabeth Pena's home, and at this point, they have a couple of different options available to them for reaching their destination. The first is to continue down West 34th Street until they reach the intersection of Jester Boulevard which they'll take north until they come up to Lamont Lane. The second is to take the back way through to the park. We already know the direction that the girls would ultimately take, so let's just say for the sake of argument that they had continued along West 34th Street and had taken it up to Jester Boulevard. I've done a fair bit of research into the crime levels of this area, and from what I've been able to piece together, I can say that this particular stretch of West 34th Street probably wouldn't have been considered extremely dangerous back in the early 1990s. However, this part of Texas was experiencing issues with gangs and criminal activities were on the rise back then. I think it's very fair to say that this area would not have been a great place to be walking around at late at night, especially for two young girls. To further illustrate my point, I'm going to bring up a graph from CrimeGrade.com. This graph provides a street view of the areas that experience the highest amounts of crime. The green areas are the safest, and the red areas are the most dangerous. We can see right away that this park carries with it a much higher level of crime than the neighborhoods on the other side of the road. Now as we approach the corner of Jester Boulevard, we can see that there's not a lot in the way of streetlights. I would imagine that this area north of the taco stand would be quite dark late at night. In fact, it almost looks like a country road. We're going to head up a little bit further and we've now reached a bridge. If you look off in the distance, the fenced area that you see is actually the back of the Clearbrook apartment complex, now known as the Montebello Apartments. The girls would have started their journey from back here by slipping through a gap in the fence. According to what I've read in Pure Murder, the fence actually had barbed wire at the top, yet another important reference to the amount of crime that was in the area back then. Now as we proceed up ahead, we'll notice that the sidewalk on the left side of the road is going to turn into a bike path. This trail is called the White Oak Bayou, and it eventually leads out into the park, but not before we hit the railroad tracks. And these tracks are actually quite important because they're one of the only ways out of this particular portion of the park. As we continue further ahead, we're now going to see that the sidewalk takes us into the park. There's also a sidewalk on the other side of the road, which of course you can take north. But let's just assume, for the sake of argument, that the girls had decided to head into the park. It's a nice summer evening, We'll just take a stroll through the park over here and do you see that flattened land just past the trees where there's like an open area immediately before the forest? Well this is the area where the gang members were fighting each other at. 
So I'd just like to point something out. Even if the girls had left the party early and they'd taken their normal route, they could have still run into the gang here. Now things could have been different for them, of course, but the threat of danger is still very much there. There's also the chance that they might have run into something else had they proceeded further along into the park. It does have some blind spots in areas where a potential predator could have also been hiding. However, this unfortunately pales in comparison to what I'm going to show you next. We're now going to explore the alternative shortcut that the girls had decided to take through the park. In order to access this shortcut, the girls would have had to walk all the way through to the back of the Clearbrook apartment complex. Once they reached the fence, they would have had to pull back a loose board, which would have allowed them access to the grassy area behind the apartments. There are no park lights in this stretch between the back of the apartments and the railroad tracks, nor would there have been any lights along the pathway ahead. This means that the girls would have had to navigate this path completely in the dark. Remember again, it's a moonless night and they don't have any flashlights with them. Now as we take a look at the surrounding terrain, we can immediately see that this area is much rougher looking than the pathway along Jesser Boulevard. The grass here is very long and there's a lot of gang graffiti as well. Another concerning element to walking along this path is the amount of overgrowth from the nearby trees. This would have made it very difficult to be sure of your surroundings as you're walking along the path. The potential for a predator to be lurking in the nearby forest or perhaps even under the bridge is another thing that you would have to consider. How easy would it be to get away quickly if you needed to? In my opinion, not very. This path is filled with blind spots where you can't be sure of your surroundings until you ascend into them. Even the bayou in the middle of the park provides another obstacle. The final stretch of this path involves walking up a blind hill. Off to the right, there's an area of open space that can't be easily observed until you've ascended the hill. And then beyond that is the white oak bayou, which you can take out of the park. I won't sugarcoat this when I say that it made me absolutely sick to my stomach when I first saw this bridge and pictured the girls walking across here late at night. Why would Elizabeth and Jennifer feel comfortable going this way? It's been a question that's always bothered me ever since I first learned about this case. And then I did some more research and I came across something very interesting. According to what's been reported, it was Jennifer Ertman that wanted to go this way and not Elizabeth Pena. Elizabeth actually lived fairly close to the park. However, Jennifer lived about five or six miles away from here. So you have to ask yourself, how is it possible that she would have the knowledge of the shortcut? She didn't live with an easy walking distance of this park, yet she felt comfortable enough to suggest that they go this way back to Elizabeth's house. She even knew about the loose fence at the Clearbrook apartment complex. This indicates to me that Jennifer and Elizabeth must have taken this exact pathway many times. Why else would they have felt so comfortable with taking it late at night? It also stands to reason that both of the girls would have been very knowledgeable of the terrain along the pathway and that the lack of visibility would not have presented a significant problem to either one of them. We also have to take into consideration that Jennifer Ertman had a curfew, and she hadn't told her parents that she was planning to spend the night at Elizabeth's house. Another thing that must be considered is the time in which the girls entered the park. The court records showed that the girls were attacked by the gang at roughly 11.30, at which point they were roughly a mile away from Elizabeth's house. Even if the gang hadn't been there, they still could not have made this curfew. Now this is a very interesting situation in which the girls know that they can't make the curfew and yet they still choose to go into the park. Clearly their reason for going this way was not because of the curfew. 
So then, why would they choose to go through the park? Why didn't their parents offer to give them a ride home? Why didn't the girls call their parents to get a ride back? Why were the parents comfortable with letting them walk back? In the next part, we'll be discussing the aftermath of what happened the following day, the timeline for when the police were brought in, and the reason why I believe there's a lot more to this case than was originally reported. I look forward to sharing that information with you in part three. I will see you at the next one.